In chapter 9, we're going to um, start our discussion uh, about financing. Uh, kind of starting at the end with the end product, which is the what's referred to as the cost of capital. So, um, as we think about the company, and as we think about the assets that we want to buy, we now have to start thinking about where does the money come from to pay for these things. So the cost of capital represents the cost of financing the company. And uh, another way to kind of think about that is it's, it is that rate of return, the minimum rate of return, that you need to receive in order to increase firm value. So managers are going to focus on this number because they're only going to want to do projects that exceed the cost of capital. And of course we need to have a way to figure out, well, what is the best way to finance the company? What is the optimal mix of debt and equity? And of course, this all falls into some guidelines, as if you will, of how we ultimately determine how much money the company should borrow and not. And of course, that is For, uh, excuse me, later on uh, chapters that talk about the actual financing theory and concepts. So here we have a company that has uh, two opportunities. One cost $100,000, uh, has 30 year, uh, 20 years of life, expected return 7%. The least expensive financing source that they have available is debt at 6%. And since the company can earn 7% on the investment, and it only costs 6% to do it, an analyst recommends that they should undertake this particular investment. The other investment also costs $100,000, has a 20-year life, but its expected return is 12%, and the least uh, costly financing available for this is equity, and it has a return uh, or a cost of 14%. And again, since the um, cost is greater than the return, we would want to reject this since it costs more to do the project than what it's going to be ultimately um, that the project brings to the company. So the question is, we have these two projects, right? One's good, one's bad. But this second one, we have two forms of debt in this company, two forms of financing, debt and equity. What if we got a combination of the two? What if we did half the financing with debt and half the financing with equity? The overall cost, or the weighted average cost, is 10%. And of course, this 10%, uh, the first opportunity would have been rejected because... 7% obviously is less than 10, but now the second project would be accepted because its return is now greater than the cost of financing. So this is the challenge that management comes across. We find projects that we think are good projects, and we have to compare them ultimately to the cost of financing. So the cost of capital it represents the long-term sources so what are those sources there's equity there's long-term debt preferred stock although not much because companies don't issue stock uh, preferred stock then we have common stock now common stock has two two pieces or two components or two sources we can issue new common stock or we can use retained earnings, which is internally generated capital. So, let's start thinking about our, some assumptions and some, some concepts and working our way to these uh, uh, costs and calculating the expense of financing. Business risk is the risk of being unable to cover your operating costs. We're going to assume that when a company does a new project, that that new project does not affect the firm's risk, that it's not going to alter or change the risk of the company. If it doesn't change the risk, 
then it will not change the cost of financing. So we're going to assume that projects, at least at this point, um, don't uh, change the business risk of the company. We're also going to assume the exact same thing for financial risk. We're going to assume that it doesn't change. That is, management is going to find that relationship that they feel is the best relationship, and they're not going to change that. So at least for the time being, that the costs at this moment in time are fixed because the risk of the business is then fixed. So why do we need to know the weighted average? Well, the weighted average is, is really the reality of business. That no business finances itself entirely with debt or entirely with equity, usually. Uh, certainly, you can't finance yourself entirely with long-term debt because somebody has to own the company. There has to be some uh, undertaking uh, or uh, some investment by the shareholders of the company. So again, what we want to do is we want to look at this weighted cost to try to understand how management uh, decides which projects are the best projects and which ones uh, need to be rejected. So we're going to start talking about some cost components. How do you find the cost of long-term debt? We actually have already done this in a previous chapter. In the valuation chapter, we talked about a concept or something called the yield to maturity. Well, the yield to maturity, and it's said in another way, is the cost of debt of the company. But it's the cost of the debt to the company before taxes. So we have to uh, adjust this yield to maturity to um, reflect some expenses that the company is going to incur. So net proceeds are what the company actually receives when they sell the security. For instance, let's say that there are what we refer to as flotation costs. The company is going to issue debt, and of course there are expenses that have to be uh, taken into account in order to um, uh, get the, the securities issued to the public. So these flotation costs could be underwriting costs or commissions to the investment bankers, could be legal fees, etc. So there are expenses that the company has to take in order to um, get securities to the public. The net proceeds, then, is ultimately the um, actual amount of money that's received from the issuance of uh, securities to the public. So the after-tax cost, then, is that uh, rate of return, then, multiplied by the tax bracket, 1 minus the tax bracket. So our before-tax cost is representative of a yield number. It's the part of the expenses that are actually paid, but the government allows us to subsidize debt, so we multiply the uh, before tax cost of debt times 1 minus T, which is uh, obviously is the corporate tax bracket. So here we have a company. We're going to sell $10 million worth of 20-year debt 9% is the coupons with a par value of $1,000. Now, because the current market interest rates are greater than 9%, since interest rates are a little bit higher now, the company is going to have to sell the bonds for less than $1,000. They're going to sell it at $980. That is what the uh, net price to the public has to be. Now, flotation costs are 2% of the par, or in this case, $20, obviously. So the net proceeds is $960. Now we have a 
um, a cost of capital worksheet that we're going to complete. And here's the bond section. And of course, we enter into that the data we have. 9%, 20% is N. The price that we could pay is $20 or 980. Rotation costs are $20. Notice we put that there in dollars, not in percentages. Tax rates 40%, and of course the par value is 1,000. So as we go across, we can find here is the cost of debt before tax. The before tax cost of borrowing is 9.45%. However, because taxes or interest is tax deductible, the after tax cost is 5.67%. That is the 9.45 times 1 minus T. So that's how we calculate the cost of borrowing money. Next, we have the cost of preferred stock. Preferred stock dividends can either be in dollars or they could be in as a percentage of par, but it really isn't significant which way it is. The cost of preferred stock is just a ratio. It's the dividends that are paid divided by the net proceeds for the sale of preferred stock. Again, net proceeds is that amount that is reflective of uh, the price that we can sell the stock at less the cost of issuing the particular shares that we have. So here we have this company again. They're going to issue 10% preferred stock. They expect to sell it for $87. The cost of issuing is expected to be $5 per share. The dividend is 10%, so it's 10% of $8.70, of $8.70. The net proceeds equals $82. That's the $87 minus the $5 flotation cost. So the ultimate cost of this preferred stock is 10.67%. Now, what we say here is the implication of this is that the par value of this stock is actually this $87. Uh, the, the current selling price does not have to be the par value of the stock, although it could be. In this case, again, when we put the data into the preferred stock section, 8.7 is the dividend. Price is $87. That's the, uh, uh, the selling price. And the flotation costs are $5. So then to calculate the cost of preferred, it's 10.61%. There's no tax implication for dividends or selling or, or issuing preferred stock. So the before tax cost of uh, preferred is exactly equal to the after tax cost of preferred. They're equal. So now what about common stock? Well, there's two forms of common stock financing. Retained earnings or internally generated capital and issuing new common stock. So we need to calculate and determine both costs. What are the differences between the two? So for the constant growth uh, model that we had when we valued stock, if you took D1 and divided by the current price plus G, that gave you R sub S, which is the cost of retained earnings for the company. How do we do this with dividends, etc.? So here we have the cost of common stock. The price is, uh, uh, is $50 per share. We're going to pay a dividend next year of $4, right? The dividends paid over the last couple of years, 2010 to 2015, are given here. So we're going to have to use that money to calculate the growth rate of dividends calculate that annual growth rate, we find out that it's approximately 5%. Substituting D1 and the price and the growth rate of dividends, we find that the actual cost is 13% for the retained earnings of the company. So that's one method for calculating the cost of retained earnings. It's based on that Gordon model. A net method to calculate that is we could also use what's referred to as the capital asset pricing model. We talked about this earlier. 
and that has the risk-free rate. We get that from treasury bonds. We need to know the beta of the company, and we need to know the average rate of return on the stock market. So again, for this company, we see the risk-free rate we're saying is 7, beta is 1.5, and the return on the market is 11%. When you plug that into this uh, data, we end up again with a 13% as the cost of financing. Now, it's not normal that those two things, you notice they're equal, it is not normal that they would be equal. Frequently, we're going to have to average them together. But here is our data spot for the common stock. Again, plugging this information. Note down here where it says D1 if given. So if you weren't given D1, if we were to use the, uh, the dividend payment stream back here, so here's 2015, what, you know, we want to predict 2016. If we use that number, then we wouldn't need or wouldn't want to input D1. But in this case, we know what it is, so we're going to utilize that. And of course, up here are our expenses. So, so far, we know the cost of retained earnings using the dividend model is 13%, and the cost of retained earnings using the security market line formula is also 13%. And of course, we're going to average those two together, so we still end up with 13%. Again, it is not likely that those numbers will always agree with each other. So again, these two models come from things that, diff you know, they come from different points in view. And I, I guess that's the point we're trying to make here is that the capital asset pricing model is a theoretical pricing model. The constant growth model doesn't really look at risk. It looks at past performance and the stock price of the company. So they're not going to agree with each other. Again, another difference, obviously, is when uh, we use the uh, uh, growth model uh, formula, we have to understand that, the, you know, if you're talking about new common stock, new common stock has expenses associated with it. So again, we need to adjust our formula frequently to look at how we calculate um, these values. So again, let's think about again. R sub R is the cost of retained earnings. We've found out so far that that number equals 13%. What about new issues? A couple of things with new issues. First, the thing, we, we've already talked about this idea of flotation costs, but we want to address this new issue of something referred to as underpricing. Imagine a company wants to issue new stock. They need this to buy a new piece of equipment, but they already have stock that trades. So how do you get people not to buy the stock that already trades, but to buy the stock that you want to issue now so you can buy the piece of equipment? The only way to ensure they buy the new shares is to sell it at a lower price. So this is going to be incorporated into our formula. So the cost of new shares is D sub 1 divided by net proceeds. And net proceeds includes the flotation cost, but also includes the um, underpricing component. What we'll ultimately find out then, since n sub n here is less than p sub zero, it has to be, it's a smaller number, the cost of new common stock is always going to be greater than retained earnings, and of course, Stock is riskier than any other form of financing, so costs in general of uh, using equity will be more than the cost of using retained earnings. So again, if we plug in this $3 per share underpricing, we ultimately end up then with $4 is the dividend next year. Here are the ultimate net proceeds, $44.50. So we end up then with a cost of the new shares, of issuing new shares, of 14%. Again, all we have to do is add that data here into our formula. What are the flotation costs? $5.50. When you plug that in, now we didn't get exactly that number. It's rounded a little bit, but it's 13.99%. So in summary, we have these costs. 
here's the cost of debt before tax here's the cost of preferred the cost of retained earnings and we also then have the cost of new common stock so the next part of this chapter will be to try to understand how we use this information of costs in order to calculate the total financing of the company.